some uh, trees in general spend more water uh, than uh, like uh, herbs and uh, uh, early successional plants because uh, early successional plants when there is a disturbance it is usually it is not very big like when there is natural gap dynamics so when there is a disturbance these plants that pioneer species they don't need to run the biotic pump it is done for them by the remaining forest so they are uh, different and they uh, don't transpire as actively <laughs> and this is precisely we are like big animals we use these pioneer species so most of them give rise to our agricultural species so we use those species that don't run the biotic pump. Hello, everyone. Wherever you are, whether this is morning, afternoon, or evening, we welcome you to this monthly series, Life Saves the Planet, co-sponsored by Biodiversity for a Livable Climate and GBH Forum Network. We are very pleased to bring to you today three distinguished speakers coming to us from Europe, coming to us from the Czech Republic, in fact, um, although they have gathered there to make this presentation. John Shu is the moderator, and he has moderated events for this series before. And uh, he's joining us from New York State. John will do more of an introduction, but I want to tell you that Jan Pokorny is a, a botanist. Um, his main scientific interest lies in evaluating energy and evapotranspiration in connection with, with plants, with vegetation. I, I should quickly add that this is primarily about biotic pump theory which is a complex process um, that really is so important and its findings are developing so quickly that we, um, that we all need to understand what it's talking about and how it will be very useful to us both in understanding our current climate situation and in understanding ways to go forward in mitigating some of the worst effects of climate change. So um, all of our speakers represent an aspect of biotic pump theory. Jan, as a botanist, Anastasia Makareva as, um, as um, basically a physical scientist on the faculty at uh, the St. Petersburg Polytechnic Institute and the Munich Institute of Technology. That is also true for Andre, who is a nuclear physicist also at the St. Petersburg University and at the Munich Institute of Technology. And Jan Pokorny is um, not only an associate professor, but also the founder of an organization named Enki, which he will mention, I think, to you briefly, but it's a very important research institution, which we have much to learn from. So without further ado, I am going to turn this over to John Schul and look forward to hearing all of you again. Thank you. Thank you, Paula. Uh, so I'm happy to be here, uh, stepping in for Hart Hagen, who was unable to make it. Um, I will try to uh, honor his uh, good work. And I'm gonna just provide a very brief introduction. Uh, I was trained as a biological psychologist once upon a time. Um, and for the last few days, I've been learning a lot of fundamental physics. What I have here, and I'm trying, there you go. Um, what I've learned in recent conversations with uh, Jan and Anastasia and Andre is that a fundamental property of water offers a really profoundly fresh perspective on understanding not just the physics of water, 
or even the dynamics of climate, but the role of life in regulating the planet. Um, the thing that I hadn't realized before was that one liter of water, and you can see a little dot on the far left when it's in the liquid form, takes up a thousandth of the volume of water vapor, the invisible gas that actually drives climate here. And they, this, that's not news. What is news is that plants play a really important role in vaporizing water, as Jan will discuss, that the water vapor and the change in air pressure that that results has local as well as global consequences, which Anastasia and the biotic pump theory will illuminate, and that those factors together can even, in the work of our guest Andre Nefyadov, predict some of the characteristics of the hurricanes that are getting more and more intense as the role of plants on our planet changes. So it's a deep and broad story. And we will begin with a review of the fundamentals of physics from Jan Pokorny and the role of plants in channeling those fundamentals into the water and the moisture and the humidity that we can all experience when we walk into our yards. Uh, Jan Pokorny. So good day to everybody. I hope you listen me well. I first many thanks. We can be here. We can speak together. We are in Central Europe, south of Czech Republic. I will speak on the role of vegetation in partitioning of solar energy, water cycle, climate. Let us imagine that sun doesn't work, what would happen? Sun heats our planet. Atmosphere would be solid, would be frozen without energy of sun. These big numbers, 180,000 terawatt. This is the energy flow from sun to earth. In our economy, what we buy and what we sell, it is just 16 terawatt. So it's good to think and to deal with the uh, sun energy and to learn more, because without it, no life. If we have cloudy day, we know that there is less sunshine. If we have sunny day, there is more sunshine. On vertical axis of this graph, there is incoming solar energy, which we measure in watts per square meter on the Horizontal axis is a day, daily hours. You see that on sunny day, solar energy reaches the, which reaches land surface, goes up to 1000 watts per square meter. If there is overcast, like you see on the picture on the right hand side, the incoming solar energy is several times lower, let's say, Less, even less than 100 watts per square meter. So we can measure solar energy and it changes according to clouds. We can see what solar energy does with temperature, which means with water vapor and so on. Here is a picture, are pictures in visible light, how we see the world. And then the color pictures which are thermal pictures. So it's a thermal camera which sees different temperatures. On left-hand side, there is a view from our town hall and the temperatures of roof are, ov are over 50 Celsius and the temperature of the wetlands or wet meadow are substantially lower, let's say, when I speak about in Celsius, it will be 29, less than 30. The next picture, which we made using thermovisual camera and light uh, airplane, you see the normal landscape, agriculture landscape in summer afternoon, and the temperatures are in range 30, 29, 28, up to 50 degrees. Why? Why we have such a 
big difference of temperatures. You see the scale from 51 Fahrenheit to 132. What is the reason? Is it reflection? Is it photosynthesis? What is it? The most important is to realize that there is a evaporation and there is a so-called latent heat of vaporization. In the picture, you see one liter of water. We have to add energy in order to convert one, lit one liter of water liquid into the water vapor. This energy is called latent heat of vaporization and approximately it is 0.7 kilowatt hours per one liter of water. So we need energy like is the capacity of your battery in car, which is about 0.7 kilowatt hour. And then from one liter of water liquid, we have 1,300 liters of water vapor. Therefore, steam engine works. And when the water vapor condensates back to water liquid, the energy is again released and water pressure drops because from 1,300 liters, we have again one liter of liquid. Down is written 18 grams of water vapor has volume 22,400 milliliters. Maybe somebody will remember that one mole of gas has a volume 22.4 liters, which is Avogadro law. And here is what John already mentioned. One liter of water, when evaporates, you have a steam volume of 1,300 liters, and there is a hidden latent energy in the water vapor. Let us have a look how it looks on the full sunshine. We look at the uh, pavement and measure with a simple but very correct and very practical instrumentation. There is a 877 watt per square meter coming. It's incoming solar radiation. Surface temperature of the sunshine pavement is 100. 24 Fahrenheit. We, we measure it with the thermometer in Celsius, which is down on right hand side. Let's have a look and go in shade of tree. Now we are in the shade and there is a 82 watt per square meter of solar radiation coming and the temperature is lower. We had a 120 Fahrenheit, and here we have 80 Fahrenheit. Why? It is because the water evaporates. We call it transpiration. The tree takes water by roots. It goes through trunk and through leaves. Imagine there is a 100, 200 stomata, which are small valves, on square millimeter of a leaf and they control the evaporation of water. Believe me that 20 liters of water was evaporated during one hour by the tree. We multiply 20 by the latent heat of water, which was 0.7 kilowatt hour, and we see 20 times 0.7 is 14. So our tree here cools for with a capacity or power 14 kilowatts, 14 kilowatts. So, and photosynthesis, it doesn't take so much. It photosynthesis just fix solar energy into sugars and biomass about with the rate 0.2 kilowatts. Here we compare the cooling of three, cooling by evaporation with the air conditioner, each of that, of this air conditioner consumes 3.4 kilowatts. So one tree is the equivalent of cooling of four, the four air conditioner. However, this air conditioner takes, uh, sends cool into the room and sends heat out. Where does tree 
sends the heat. It is hidden in the water vapor and it will be released on cool places or high in atmosphere or, or early morning as a dew. So our tree equalized temperature. This air conditioner, it just makes our town more hot. <clears throat> we can consider as a average water evaporation rate 100 milligram per square meter per second. And then it is a cooling efficiency, 240 watt per square meter. We might need this number. And then it is important to realize that for each molecule of CO2 of carbon dioxide, one molecule of carbon dioxide is taken by photosynthesis, one molecule of oxygen is released, and several hundred molecules of water is released, is evaporated. Now, we have a dry place in the uh, landscape. The dry surface overheats and the hot air goes up and it sucks humidity from a side. Sometimes we use logic and we say, oh, dry surface is innocent. It doesn't evaporate water. Nothing wrong can happen. No, we are drying up because we have too many dry places, like parking places, uh, highways, our roofs, or drained landscape. Similarly, such a hot air, which ascends very fast, will take water from the fish pond or from small lake. And then we complain that lake is losing water because it's open water. It is because we have too much dry, dry places which overheats. In forest, there is a so-called inversion temperature. The upper part of forest has a relatively higher temperature than lower part. So you have a 30 meter high forest. At the bottom, there is a lower temperature. In crowns, there is a bit higher temperature. So, so air just lays in the forest because the cooler air is a heavier than the warmer one. When we cut forest, or when the forest die due to bark beetle, for example, it stop evaporation because the trees are dead and we have very high temperature on such a dry forest, which happens now in our country due to bark beetle. When we have a look on corn, then corn, because we kill, we eradicated weeds, it has a naked soil, and naked soil has a, has a higher temperature than, upper, than the cover, than the surface of the plant stand. And therefore, the hot air, warm air goes up from the cone. Now, I will finish with the example we did with Professor Mitch from United States. And during the last 200 years in States, there was a drainage of wetland. A lot of wetlands were drained. There is a table here showing how much. And we have a look, what does it mean for the change of the uh, airstream and uh, energy budget? In If about 46 million hectares, which means 460,000 square kilometer of wetlands were drained, then the during sun uh, weather, during sunshine, a lot of energy is released. And this energy, which is released as a heat, we can compare with nuclear power stations efficiency. So what happened during 200 years in, in uh, uh, due to wetland drainage, that the so-called sensible heat production, which is heat, which then warm air, it increase of equivalent 55,000 nuclear power station, which is on the right-hand side, which is our nuclear power station, and 30 kilometers from here, two gigawatts. And we have heat production 55,000 gigawatts. Just the message of my talk is the water and plant vegetation played important role in local climate. We 
can explain it by relatively simple physics or basic physics and human modification of a landscape by deforestation, industrial agriculture, urbanization. It destroys the capacity of ecosystem to use energy for evaporation and life processes. Degraded ecosystems cannot equalize differences in temperature and air pressure. Then we have torrential rains, hurricanes, and so on. And it will be explained by my kind colleagues who are here. We are together. The last uh, picture shows just the links where we work, some book which are available, and the education program also we made. So thank you for your attention. And now is then of uh, thank you, Jan. Jan. Thank you, Jan. Um, before I introduce uh, Anastasia, Jan has just told us that the impact of plants on the atmosphere and the energy budget of the planet is huge. And that one of the consequences of that is that you get these huge changes in vapor pressure. And those huge changes in vapor pressure um, pack a huge amount of energy into vapor. The vapor drifts up into the air. That's why it's cooler in the presence of plants is because they are literally taking heat away from the surface in the form of air vapor. And when that vapor condenses, the big change in volume has two effects. One is it releases energy, some of which goes right back out to space, helping us balance the energy budget. And that big decrease in vapor pressure produces a vacuum. And into that vacuum comes winds and air currents and all sorts of consequences that are the focus of the theory of the biotic pump. Anastasia Makarieva and her mentor, Viktor Gorshkov, have been developing that um, theory for quite some time. And we have Makarieva herself to tell her that part of the story. Okay. Uh, thank you, Yuan. Thank you very much uh, for inviting me to his, to speak here about our work. <clears throat> uh, so I work in theoretical physics division, Petersburg Nuclear Physics Institute in St. Petersburg, Russia, and also in Institute for Advanced Study, Technical University of Munich, and I'm part of Biotech Pump Greening Group. And so what we will discuss is the hydrological difference between natural forest and deforested land. What does it imply? Uh, what does this change imply for us and for our hydrological cycle? So Jan told you that basically natural forest is cool due to transpiration and deforested land is hot. But what, in, what does it mean for the water cycle? So let's take a look uh, at the water cycle on land. So first, forest transpiration adds water vapor to the atmosphere. As Jan said, about 200 molecules of water are added per each CO2 molecule fixed during the photosynthesis. So it is a bigger, uh, some people think that it is a waste of water. Why so much? Then this water vapor condenses in the upper cold atmosphere forming clouds, okay? And then it rains. And so is this the role of forests just to re-evaporate the rain that is falling down? In this context, we could say that the forest act as a sponge. And we discussed it with Hart Hagen before, uh, before. so it's a good uh, idea, but the problem is that this sponge leaks, right? We have river flow uh, from land to the ocean because land is elevated over the ocean. So due to gravity, it loses water. And 
all soil water could run off to the ocean in just a few years. These are very basic undisputed estimates. So there must be a compensatory import of moisture. And it does exist and it goes by the atmosphere and the winds bring water vapor from, the, from over the ocean to land. And here is an important point that we need, need to keep in mind. For there to be rain, it is not sufficient that there is just a horizontal airflow which brings water vapor. A horizontal airflow brings water vapor and takes it away. Nothing happens. For there to be rain, the air must ascend. And as it ascends, it cools. And only then there is condensation and precipitation. It is like a river. It flows, but it doesn't give you water. You need to take a bucket and take it from the river. So if there is a wind, a flying river, it doesn't bring you moisture. You need to take it from this river. So this ascending air motion does this job. It cools, the air cools, and so you, you get, we get our water. And then dry air flows back to the ocean. So now uh, a complex, more complicated point, which actually brings the dynamics into all this picture. Rainfall probability, so the probability that the air rises, increases with growing humidity of the atmosphere. So the more humid the atmosphere is, the more readily it rains. You see this graph, which shows this rain intensity depending on the uh, total contact or co uh, content of water vapor in the atmospheric column. So you see it rises very quickly, like uh, uh, for 20% increase in water, con water vapor content, you have like two orders of magnitude increase in rain rate. But another complication that this is true for sufficiently wet atmospheres only. Look at the left part of this graph. You see this like plateau. In a dry atmosphere, rainfall doesn't increase as the water vapor content grows. So and this is important and uh, uh, this has crucial implications, which are that the water cycle on land exists in two regimes, which you can call the wet and the dry one. In the wet regime, which is like when the atmosphere is moist enough, forest transpiration increases humidity and precipitation increase. And as you can see to the right picture, when the air begins to rise and precipitation grows, we, there is a horizontal inflow of moist air that sustains this high moisture content and sustains precipitation. And this is what the biotic pump is about. More forest, more transpiration, higher humidity, more rain, more import of moisture, and has, hence a higher river flow. So more forest, more river flow. That's in the, the wet. More yeah. forest, more river flow in the wet regime. In the wet right? regime, right. So the, impo the important point here is that um, the system that we that you've just reviewed and that we've learned about in school about the water cycle presumes adequate moisture and the right conditions. But in the dry regime, that whole pattern breaks down and yeah. other things begin to happen. Thank you. Uh, yeah, very, thank you, Yun. You're absolutely right. And in the dry regime, the, the story goes totally different. Trees transpire, humidity increases, but the air is still very far from saturation when condensation commences. So precipitation does not increase. And what happens to the transpired moisture? There are always some winds around that they, they just blow uh, it away. And then we have more, more trees, which we carefully planted that care about them, but these are just remove moisture from soil and it is all blown away. And we have less river flow because in a steady state, river flow matches what has been brought from the 
from the from the ocean. And if we just dispatch, so we could even have a negative river flow. So we are just become a source of moisture for somebody else and dry out. So so this is um, uh, and conversely, it it looks like. Imagine now that we cut off the forest, and um, then if the circulation hasn't changed, we get more more rain, and it is not transpired, and we it all runs to the ocean. So we have a high runoff when there is uh, fewer trees, and so this unrecognized or poorly recognized duality is a source of confusion. Like you see this famous story with blind people who are trying to understand what an elephant is. And depending on what they touch, they have they made this image, either it is a wall or a snake or, or a tree or whatever. And so there is people who are studying the water cycle in the dry and the wet regime, they live like in different universes. And because those in the wet regime, they argue that forests are good for the water cycle and they intensify the entire water cycle. While those who only see the ecosystem are often a degraded one in the dry regime, they argue equally fervently that no, planting more trees will deteriorate the water cycle. And there is a lot of confusion here. And so indeed in the uh, dry regime, we can see this is the picture that Jan showed that indeed uh, there is this, uh, due to a lot of dry areas around, the forest transpires, but it is all blown away. And now it, it all looks like a question like this graph, it all belongs to fundamental science, like how precipitation probability depends on the water content. But in fact, it translates into very heated uh, debates uh, that concern our immediate well-being. I give you examples. What about the prescribed fires? Uh, the the uh, a widely held view, and I not, here I quote American experts, and you can see this publication. A widely held view is that we, when we don't uh, uh, cut forests for some time, protect them, there accumulates a lot of biomass, and it will burn. So we must log all forests regularly. But in reality, people find that protected forests burn less. And what does it mean? Probably these protected forests have self-restored to the wet regime. And then if these forests know how to remain on the wet side, how can we plan to destroy native ecosystems to, to get less fires? And here we can see that California Chaparral Institute is now about to sue California fire because they have a program of intentional destruction of native ecosystems to, to, to make less biomass, which won't burn. Yes, of course, if we have zero biomass, it won't burn. But there is biomass, or better to say, uh, genetically programmed consortium of living beings that know how to keep moist. And if we cut them or destroy them, we will do ourselves uh, uh, in, into a big trouble. And so there is an independent concept which uh, like, you know, converges to this dry and wet duality from the ecological side, from ecosystem science. And it was uh, proposed by Dr. Lindenmeyer from Australia, the concept of landscape tra trap. And it shows that when you exploit the ecosystem beyond the limit, you can see here, repeatedly logged forests become uh, even aged young forests, they grow fast, so they are economically feasible, economically profitable, but they have high flammability and the ecosystem cannot self restore. And so each returning fire destroys it even further and the ultimate state is stable desert. So, so 
at a certain point, we transit, we go from this wet regime, which self restores to the wet state, to a degradation trajectory, from which it is very difficult to uh, to to re, uh, to come back uh, to uh, to this wet to the stable wet state. And so the hydrological difference is that it, for the natural forest evolutionary. Uh, there is fine tuning with local geophysical conditions and increased transpiration moisture in the atmosphere such that moisture import increases, high precipitation, high river flow, high storage of moisture, fewer fires. When we deforest, we have dry atmosphere and we have the danger of falling into a landscape trap. When planting more trees no longer improves the hydrological regime. And in this state, we look at the remaining plants and we begin to think that they are wasting water. Then fires begin more frequent. Then we are angry with these remaining plants and destroy them, they are cleared. And so we end in the desert as the unstable state. So what is the strategy, what to do? First of all, we need to preserve all ecosystems that retain hydrological competence. That is, they know how to remain on the wet side. And simply stopping their ongoing destruction will slow down the climate destabilization that we are all suffering from. And for the deforested land, we are in a big trouble. We need to restore degraded land. We need to consider whether it is possible to switch back to the wet regime. And we, it is really like, you know, the patient can be already dead and you can do nothing. So. But if there is hope, we should make a very careful meteorological analysis and begin ecological restoration from the most humid places and expand from there. And here we need to think of ecosystem medicine uh, and be prepared to, uh, do, to perform extraordinary efforts. So that's it, uh, thank you very much. And um, here is just more information about the work. Thank you, Anastasia. What I got from that is that, first of all, one thing that, um, I, that I think is really important to emphasize is that the biotic pump theory has already become very famous because this inflow of moisture produced by trees is actually bringing moisture in the wet regime from the oceans onto the land. When that system breaks down, not only does the rain stop, but the land dries out. Dehydration, ultimately resulting in the dry regime and the desert, turns out to be a huge problem on land. It's a huge problem for the temperature where humans live on land. And the question is, where does all of that moisture go? If the continents are drying out, it turns out a lot of that moisture accumulates over the oceans. And that's where hurricanes happen. And that's the story that Andre is going to illuminate. So that brings us to Andre Nefiadov, who's going to talk about the high levels of and the increasing levels of water in the oceanic atmosphere and how that results from interactions with terrestrial vegetation. I would like to uh, continue the Anastasia talk uh, uh, from another side. So if there is a biotic uh, control of water cycle, it allows us to, to keep some optimal conditions. But if the biotic control is violated, then it causes a water cycle extremes. And actually, I want to, uh, to talk about these particular cases. Let's have a look again on this curve. This curve was <clears throat> obtained on the um, uh, measurements in Amazon. And biotic control concerns on the middle part of the, of the curve, with dependence of precipitation with respect to column water vapor content. The extremes like droughts and, uh, and floods it correspond to the end part of this curve. 
if the color water uh, vapor contains less than 20 millimeter of water or larger than 16 millimeters, then we have extremes. Droughts occur due to insufficient inflow of the moist air, but flood and floods occur because the forest does not remove excess of moisture from the atmosphere. So we have two extremes, which actually have the same origin, namely the violation of uh, biotic pump. But <clears throat> the natural forest can balance, uh, it plays very, uh, it plays, uh, uh, makes very complicated task. It balances uh, water flows, evaporation, precipitation, atmospheric moisture conversions in, form of, in gas form from the adjacent areas from the ocean and real flow. So it balances all the flows. If this balance is violated, then you have extremes. And it is not by accident that <clears throat> hurricanes, uh, they also uh, appear in the same part of the graph as, uh, as floods. It, it, they also correspond to, to the um, extremely high uh, water vapor content in atmosphere in column. Uh, now we try to understand the mechanism of uh, hurricanes. Uh, biotic part concept allows us uh, to, to go deep into the, uh, into the problem. Uh, we have discovered a fundamental relationship between drop in air pressure from condensation and hurricane intensity. Um, because of condensation of water vapor, um, there is a pressure, pressure drop. And it can be considered, the pressure of atmospheric gases can be considered as a, a store of potential energy. And when there is a pressure drop, then it can cause the kinetic movement of air masses. And uh, this, uh, uh, what, is written, what is written here, it's equation between the potential energy and kinetic energy of the, of the air motion. Uh, in non-relativistic case, you have one or a half mass times uh, velocity squared. But we are talking about the gas and we consider the uh, mass of unit volume. So instead of mass, we, we have here um, uh, the error density. So if we put some experimental parameters like um, uh, partial pressure of water vapor, which is about 3% of atmospheric air pressure, it's a 30 hectopascal, um, and take into account the air density, which is about one kilogram per uh, a cubic meter, we get the air velocity of about 70 meters per second. And this gives us the real scale for velocity in hurricanes. So we see that the, the power of hurricanes originates from the pressure drop of um, water vapor. And it is known that if uh, hurricanes, mm, after, uh, when it goes through, it leaves afterwards a dry footprint of suppressed rainfall in their wake. So water vapor is a fuel for hurricanes. And actually tornadoes have the same mechanisms as hurricanes. They, they, they differ only by the special size of condensation area, but the mechanism is the same. Um, you see the, uh, the, the water vapor pressure about 30 hectopascal is the same for any vertex like big one, like a cyclone or middle sized like hurricane or tornado. So it means that from physical point of view, all these vertexes have the same origin. They are, uh, they are based on uh, condensation of water vapor. Can you see the map with yes. trees? With uh, storm tracks, which made uh, which were made uh, between 1985 and 2005 for 20 years, and we see the following: the biggest 
density of tracks is located on near the uh, western coastal coastal part of the uh, USA where we have degraded uh, forest. And it seems that even for, from the first of first look, it seems that these two uh, um, things are connected because uh, between two forests, namely Amazon and Congo, we haven't seen, we don't see any, any tr uh, track. There is no, uh, no hurricanes between them. And why? Um, this graph shows um, uh, the ratio of uh, precipitation over land and over ocean. When does it work? Okay, so uh, uh, again, on, on this axis, we have the, the ratio of precipitation over land with respect to the precipitation over ocean. So this is a distance uh, from this point to this one. Um, on the three graphs, latitude um, of uh, Equator, uh, about um, 300 kilometers from Equator. And we see that um, precipitation over land, over Amazon forest and over Congo forest is always larger than precipitation over the ocean. So uh, the forest sucks the water vapor from the ocean uh, because of biotic pump and does not allow uh, water vapor content exceed some extreme values. And this is the reason why there is no hurricanes here. And now we see how the biotic pumps, pump works uh, in, in case of Amazon rainforest. These graphs, the blue one is a precipitation, a black one is evaporation, evapotranspiration, a red one is water vapor content in atmospheric column. And, and this uh, exists is a time uh, relative to the wet season. So zero corresponds to the onset of wet season. So uh, uh, three months before the wet season, Amazon rainforest start to evaporate. It increases the evaporation, moistens the, the air up to the maximum, and it, uh, it causes the increase in uh, precipitation. And um, because of condensation of uh, water vapor, uh, um, convergence of uh, water vapor from uh, other adj adjacent uh, areas start to uh, starts. So uh, when the um, water vapor content reaches the maximum, evaporation uh, start to decrease, but precipitation continue to increase. And this is a um, this is a actually very wise uh, work because Amazon rainforest knows when and how to switch on the evaporation to attract water vapor from the ocean. Uh, so it, it's one point. The second point is that the, the power of Amazon forest is, uh, which can be estimated as, um, according to the net primary productivity, uh, net prim primary productivity is a, a rate of uh, energy um, uh, rate of energy accumulation of uh, organic substances due to photosynthesis. Yeah, right. So the Amazon forest uh, sucks the, the knows how to um, control the um, water vapor regime, and it, it, it has enormous power. So let me summarize. If the forest the forest is disturbed, the regulation of water cycle becomes violated. Hurricanes require a lot of water vapor as fuel, but natural forests can take the water vapor away from the ocean. And we see that there is no hurricanes between Amazon and Congo forest. But destruction of Amazon biotic pump makes more vapor remain of Atlantic Ocean and uh, stopping the Amazon deforestation will reduce the livelihood of hurricanes in the US.
Thank you very much. The, as, as I understand it, um, we've seen that changes in water, water vapor pressure, what I would call, uh, well, water vapor pressure produces huge changes in air volume. And that produces wind currents as the air fills that in. And that produces um, rain on land and uh, can potentially ameliorate hurricanes over the oceans. Now, we have some questions in the Q&A and I'm just gonna go to the top of, uh, top of the list here. Um, one question is, is this true for all plants? Do all plants um, fix energy and cause transpiration or are trees particularly powerful in this regard? I think I would reply. Yeah. <clears throat> I think it's on plant physiologists to reply. There, are, there is a whole range of plants. Some, we call them wetland plants. You can imagine willow. It transpirates very fast. It can give a lot of water into the atmosphere. On the other side, you have a succulent plants like cactus, and they take CO2 in night in order to save water. And during a the day, they use solar energy and uh, provides photosynthesis using light and so on. So there is a whole scale of plants. And for the biotic pump, we need those who can intensely uh, evaporate water, what, which is process we call transpiration. That is this process, one molecule CO2 and 200 molecule of water is evaporated. I hope I answered the question. So plants in general, um, but the second question talks about um, trees in particular. She, um, uh, Mayara from Brazil is concerned about the Amazon and Alpha um, points out that there's also been recent works that suggest that trees in particular, because they stick up into the, into the sky, they can slow winds. And so the question is, are there particular issues with regard to trees that will ultimately end up modulating the effects of the biotic pump? Oh, yes. Uh, first of all, uh, regarding Alpha Lu uh, question, uh, when the wind slow, slow down, uh, this is what we need because we need the air to, to rise and not just, you know, flow by. So, for example, uh, in China, after large-scale large regreening, as we show in our uh, a recent paper, we analyze it, but also other researchers. Uh, moisture conversions increases when the total flow of air decreases. So, and so the wind uh, declines. So it is natural. These two processes uh, go hand in hand. And, uh, you know, uh, trees are, uh, first of all, some uh, trees in general spend more water uh, than uh, like... Uh, herbs and uh, uh, su early successional plants. Because uh, early successional plants, when there is a disturbance, it is usually it is not very big, like when there is natural gap dynamics. So when there is a disturbance, these plants that pioneer species, they don't need to run the biotic pump. It is done for them by the remaining forest. So they are uh, different and they uh, don't transpire as actively. And this is precisely, we are like big animals. We use these pioneer species. So most of them give rise to our agricultural species. So we use those species that don't run the biotic pump, uh, right? Yes, in yes. order to save water. Yes, right. and could I, pick, I also picked up two questions. Can I, because I sh could also show from the previous list, it was asked whether there are studies showing that uh, just a moment, I will just, I even made them <clears throat> uh, to show, to open, uh, to show uh, something uh, that uh, people asked, um, just a moment, <clears throat> because it is important. So can I share my screen, okay, F just for a moment? Of course. Mm, yeah, just a moment, just a moment. So the question was, um, uh, 
Uh, do you have examples of uh, longitudinal uh, measures uh, of temperature reductions following revegetation? So you can see here, uh, uh, this is a work of Baker and Spracklin. You can see here that uh, in the Amazon, when, when you deforest, the temperature rose by more than uh, uh, one half a degree on a very small special scale, uh, like uh, five um, uh, hundreds of degree compared to uh, less disturbed forest. So this warming is being registered. And also a very famous study by Alcama and Siscati. Here you can see, you see, uh, this is how forest increased or decreased uh, between 2003 and 2012. Uh, uh, 12. Yes, and you can see, for example, temperate forest. Everything where forest decreased, uh, the temperature rose. Where forest increased, temperature declined. This is annual temperature. For boreal forest, it is mixed because the response is different in spring and uh, winter. And I have another question, but probably later I answered. So, so there are such studies. It is very yes. well registered. So um, the trees and the successional plants and the interaction of those plants with temperature and vapor and wind, they all seem to be synchronized with each other presumably through biological evolution. They depend on each other and they have been modifying the climate to produce conditions in which these forests and wetlands can thrive. Life is producing the planetary climate that makes life do well, unless we push the limit and at one end of the limit, you have extreme instability. And at the other end of the limit, you have dead, dry desert, which as you've said, is either a dead patient that we're gonna to have to resurrect or a lost cause. So preserving the green areas that we have is critical. Restoring areas that can be restored is critical. And that brings us to Maya's question. She says, in areas that have already been degraded, how do we shift conditions from the dry regime, which is the death spiral, to the wet regime, which is the happy life-sustaining cycle? Are there certain thresholds of vegetation and moisture that are necessary to meet this shift? And how do we do this? What are the practices that will allow us to push the world into the healthy zone of a self-sustaining climate. Okay. Uh, maybe I'll start with it. So it's absolutely crucial to characterize the ecosystem with respect to the um, degree of disturbance. There is a big difference between natural ecosystem and disturbed one. So, <clears throat> The natural ecosystems has ability for self restoration. So if you have disturbance, it takes time, it changes successions by natural successions. And it, the system goes to the state of, uh, uh, can be say steady state. And it can stay in this state uh, for, for the lifetime of, uh, the whole uh, ecosystem, dozens of million years. <clears throat> but one needs to also say that there is a threshold until uh, of the uh, or extends or uh, perturbation uh, when the, uh, the, the amount of uh, perturbation, when the system loses the ability for self recovering. And uh, one needs to distinguish either the system is able to self-recover itself or it's not able for, uh, to recover itself. And if, first of all, we need to save the areas which have the ability for self-restoration and, and, and use these areas for uh, 
to 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 continue the to enlarge the areas uh, for 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 restoration. As for systems which um, which are on the early stages of succession, successional stages, they don't have such an ability, and it's a uh, uh, it's still open question how to restore this system to, to the stage where it becomes self-sustainable. And uh, one needs to investigate it from different uh, sides, whether it's possible or not. So well, that, yeah. that, that point is well taken, thank you. I do know um, that there are other workers who have shown that most deserts have got a certain amount of rainfall, very few deserts, have zero rainfall. If that rain can be allowed to soak into the ground, then over time, the ground becomes moist, organisms begin the process of recovery. But I think that um, Anastasia's emergency, the hospital emergency room analogy is really important. Some of our organs are doing fine, right? Some of the forests, um, are doing what they have evolved to do. Parts of the Amazon are now in organ failure. And it's already clear, just looking at the map that we started with, that Northern Africa went downhill. It used to be covered by grass. Now it's covered by bare dirt. It's going to be that much harder to restore. The patient has certain organs that are in, de in, in great danger, certain organs that can be strengthened, and the entire patient, the planet, and the climate um, is going to need our full attention if we're all gonna make through it together. In order to do that, we need to understand the fundamental science, we need to understand the fundamental practices, and we need to look at the big picture including the biological influences, which are the ones we are adapted to. And it turns out the climate is a result of the theory of the biotic pump um, based on a fundamental understanding of photosynthesis, the changes in air pressure and winds, the effects of those winds on global climate, the effects of the dehydration of the ocean or the rehydration of the ocean, the dehydration of the land, on hurricanes, all of those things are phenomena that we're wrestling with more and more year by year. It's happening faster and faster. If we have an understanding of this, we can certainly make it less, we can slow down the degradation. We believe and we hope that we can reverse it, but only if we do the right things within the right time. I think that this perspective that you've offered needs to be much better known. The integrated story you're telling is really, really important. And even I can begin to wrap my head around it after I've heard it from you several times. And I hope that many of our listeners will follow up with the links in the, uh, in the chat. We'll look for further references. Me. And and now we get last words from our distinguished guests. Oh, yes, yes. If, if I may, I picked up another question from the previous question. And I also, this question is, um, you know, what do physicists think of the biotic pump theory, especially those who study thermodynamics? This is important. Uh, like, um, I will share my screen now. So, so. Uh, you see that um, uh, the biotic pump uh, indeed uh, proposes this pressure reduction from condensation as the major mechanism. And unfortunately, not many physicists are engaged in discussing the biotic pump theory uh, per se, because it has an ecological uh, aspect. Uh, but I could um, uh, just, uh, you know, report my experience that we are trying to engage in a discussion with uh, uh, like experts on atmospheric physics. I myself got my PhD in atmospheric physics. So, you know, and, um, but this process goes slowly. So probably this um, 
like a webinar could help us get more traction. But I could refer to you to one opinion, a rare opinion, uh, which uh, like uh, uh, considers our studies uh, from uh, the point of view of uh, uh, physicists doing thermodynamics. And it is Professor Adrian Bian, who is in his article, Discipline in Thermodynamics, actually shows, um, says that um, our paper on some aspects of atmospheric physics related to biotech pump physics was uh, surprisingly not uh, engaged with by other atmospheric physicists. So he supports our approach, and as a an as like he is not within this community, but it seems strange to him that there is no engagement. So this is what we are uh, like um, would like to have much more to to see more engagement in the discussion of these new propositions and how they could be used to improve our joint well-being. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. I think that's a great note to end on. Um, it's an ongoing discussion. Science is slow. I will add that um, the degradation of the planet is speeding up. We need to do everything faster and better, and we need to bring these points of view together. I want to thank all of our guests, uh, Jan and Anastasia and Andre, and I think Paula gets the last word. Thank you very much. First, thank you to all of the panelists who have worked very hard, long hours with us, taking their incredibly important ideas and um, making it more accessible to American audiences and to non-scientific audiences. I also want to thank the participants because they have really stayed with this. We, uh, we, had over, we have over 130 people thoroughly engaged for an hour and 15 minutes in a very complex subject. Yeah, I want to also uh, point out that Biodiversity for a Livable Climate first introduced biotic pump theory at our first conference in 2014. We referenced it, we did not present it, but we have watched how important its findings are and we are very pleased to make it possible for a much larger audience to enter into the conversation that Anastasia has asked for because indeed this is about joint well-being. This is something that we all need to be talking about and learning from and um, it's for the global, it's for global well-being. And Thank the greater good. And the greater good. Thank you all very much. We look forward to hearing from you again. <laughs>